One of the great benefits of the ministry that I get to have in the convocation is that I am daily reminded of how much I do not know. It is not just that I'm always discovering how much bigger, how much broader, how much more diverse our church is than I ever dreamed growing up in the middle of Michigan. It's not just that practically every hour delivers to me a new vocabulary word in one of the seven languages that we speak in the convocation. It's not just that I have spent these past five years in an advanced seminar on the laws governing the relationships between church and state in our eight different national jurisdictions. It is all of that together, and then on top of it, learning the ways and expectations of our many cultures and histories. The bishop who first ordained me was a monk, and he used to take us bright young things who were full of ourselves about to be ordained down a peg or two by reminding us that maybe we had been called to the ministry not because there was something lucid or special about our spirituality, but because God had more work to do to save us. And well, for whatever blessed reason, I have ended up in a ministry in which I am well acquainted with the virtue of humility. And so, what I'm about to say, I would not say unless I truly believed it. But I truly believe that in all the Episcopal Church, some 5,000 congregations in 18 different countries, there is simply no better place to celebrate the Feast of Pentecost than in this place. Your cathedral. Our cathedral is the cathedral church, the tall steeple, and the encouraging parent of all our convocation of so many different languages and cultures and nations. Last year, as he was leaving after the revival had ended, Bishop Curry took me aside in amazement, and he said to me, you know, on any given Sunday morning, you have the most diverse judicatory in all the Episcopal Church. And that's right. That's who we are. As we say in the Midwestern language, you betcha. (laughs) All the languages you just heard offering the Acts reading, that is sort of our signature feature, yeah, our flourish. And in practically every other church of the convocation this morning, there will be a similarly varied symphony of languages today. Where I grew up, In a college town in the Midwest, we used to bring over some professors from the Romance Languages Department to help leaven the loaf of our Pentecost. It was sort of like having the local farmer bring a horse to the blessing of the animals. Languages are what we do. But you know, with all of that, there are some languages we don't speak in this church. I don't mean by that that there are some languages we need to go out and collect I don't mean that simply by adding to our roster of languages is the primary reason why we should go out and plant missions in new places. What I mean is there are languages we don't speak because we are Christians. There are languages that these new sisters and brothers of ours that we will welcome today, people newly baptized or confirmed or received in this church, there are languages they must never learn. Or if they know them, they need to forget. Let me explain what I mean. We don't speak the language of fear. At least not if we are Christians. We don't speak that language because we have been commanded not to. Both at the beginning of our story and at the end of it, there is an angel in the countryside who speaks these words, do not be afraid. Those are not words of comfort. Those are words of command. We are not meant to speak the language of fear. Today, as we gather in this glorious place, your sisters and brothers of St. Nino's in Tbilisi, Georgia, one of our mission congregations, they are literally and figuratively gathering underground 
to worship in the language of the Book of Common Prayer. This past week, their government, a government infected with the most toxic form of nationalism, chose to pass a law that stigmatizes them and countless others as affiliates of a foreign agent. I am that foreign agent, and you are too. But they are not afraid. I wrote a letter to the leader of that little congregation this past week to tell him I was worried. And this is what he wrote back to me. Dear Bishop Mark, sorry for the late reply. Our situation now is so complicated, I don't have any words to say because we don't know where the country is going and what will be next. I know my message is late, but I will be thankful if the member churches of our convocation will pray for us during Pentecost Sunday services, yours in Christ, Toma. Do you notice what he didn't say? He didn't say he was afraid. There are a lot of other things, suspected, harassed, beaten up in the streets, but they are not afraid. We don't speak the language of intolerance. It took us a long while to learn this. Yes, we ordained Absalom Jones back in the late 18th century, but we thought he should only be permitted to be a priest for African-American people. Fifty years ago this year, we ordained the first 11 women to be priests in this church, finally. But we did it in a less than orderly way. A little over 20 years ago, we decided that gay and lesbian people should have full access to the ministry of this church. And just nine years ago, we decided they should have full access to the sacrament of marriage, too. So this has taken some time on our part to forget that old language and all along the way we have lost people who would prefer a church that draws lines between included and excluded fully human and less than human or as we used to say it clean and unclean we decided that Jesus meant what he said when he taught us that we are all equal before the throne of God. We decided that St. Paul had it right when he says in Galatians that the world-changing significance of the resurrection is to break down all of the categories of difference that we make to comfort ourselves, neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, neither male nor female, neither citizen nor refugee neither gay nor straight, neither white nor black, but all are one in Christ Jesus. We do not speak the language of violence. I have been traveling an insane amount this spring. I covered nine time zones in four days earlier this month. The only time I ever watch movies is on airplanes. I don't watch on the screen in front of me. I watch over the shoulders of the people in front of me. Do you do this too? I can't bear to be thought of the person who watches movies, but I watch what everybody else is watching. And then if something looks interesting, I find it on my screen and skip to the end to see how it ended. But if you do that, if you do that, what you learn very quickly in that survey of Western culture that you see over other people's shoulders is that we are seduced by violence. Shootings, explosions, beatings, they are the basic fare of most of our visual culture. It takes an heroic effort of suspending judgment to believe that somehow this is not coarsening all of us, warping our culture, enduring us to living in a more and more grotesquely violent world. This church, all of the church, has spoken the language of violence throughout history. Here in France, we fought eight, eight wars of religion in the 16th century. Thousands of innocents murdered in the mistaken belief that any one of us can know God's truth so well as to justify killing another person over matters of religion. Whenever the church has fallen into that error, 
The sacrifice of the cross has been betrayed and the message of Christ's gospel made unintelligible to the world. Whenever we fall into the violence of words or actions, the violence of betraying trust or violating the sanctity of life, we fail the terms of our covenant. So we must give up speaking that language, even if it makes us strange and suspect to the world around us. And here's the last one, the most important one. We do not ever, ever speak the language of despair. Even now, in this moment, when the ideals we have so long cherished seem to be falling under the shadow of authoritarianism and a kind of soulless populism, Even now as the ideals that we thought were the fruit of years of bloodshed in Europe and enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights are being trampled on by dictators and demagogues. Even now, we do not speak the language of despair. We do not speak the languages of fear, intolerance, violence, or despair. So you don't have to learn those. And if you know them, Forget them. But now, there are other languages that you'll have to learn. Instead of fear, you'll have to learn the language of faith. To believe, even in the absence of evidence, that God's surpassing love is with us in every difficulty and is able to overcome any hatred we confront. Instead of intolerance, You'll have to learn the language of compassion, walking with the rejected and the refugee, welcoming the stranger and the homeless, keeping vigil with the dying and the bereaved, because those are the examples Christ gave us and taught us. Instead of violence, you'll have to learn the language of wonder, a language spoken without words more often than not, wonder fluent enough to marvel every day at the beauty and majesty of God's creation in the world around us, wonder at the grace you can glimpse in the lives of the people around you. And instead of despair, you will have to learn the language of defiance of holding our ideals even in the face of catastrophe and challenge. You will have to have such a confident command of the language of defiance that with all of the rest of us, even at the gate of death, the first words on your lips will be, Alleluia! 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 Those are the languages we speak here no matter what other languages you know. So welcome to our school of faith and compassion and wonder and defiance. We have so much to say to you, and we cannot wait to teach you. Amen.